inequality, global trade restructuring under provision of global public goods, and uh, the weakening of social trust and cohesion. But in this conference, we're not just concerned about understanding the issues and challenges. More importantly, we're concerned about exploring solutions we ha because we have to be uh, solutions oriented as well. Um, especially exploring uh, possible local actions that will help us navigate the new globalization. And that is why we have this uh, plenary session on synthesis and ways forward, wherein we will have the opportunity to hear the insights and the uh, viewpoints of our esteemed panelists from the government, academe, and the private sector. And this session will be chaired and moderated by the president of the Foundation for Economic Freedom, he is also a business process outsourcing and intern internet entrepreneur and um, a prolific um, writer. He has authored uh, several uh, books and also writes a monthly column on political economy in his capacity as a board member of the Institute of Development and Econometric Analysis. He is also the founder and CEO of MRM Studios Incorporated, a digital musical services company in and Mobile Mo, an enterprise software as a, servi as a service startup. Friends, I now give you Mr. Calixto Chikiamko. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the session uh, on um, synthesis and the ways forward. Um, we will have uh, six speakers. Uh, two speakers uh, have, been, have uh, relayed that they are, will be unable to come. Uh, each speaker will have about 10 to 15 minutes each to uh, make a presentation. In this uh, concluding session, we discuss how various stakeholders can work together to navigate the turbulent seas of new glo globalization. Reflecting on the four major features discussed in the previous sessions, restructuring of the global economy, rising global inequality, new directions for cooperation on global public goods, and weakening social trust and cohesion, the panel will present strategic and practical steps to ensure that the Philippines is able to achieve sustained, accelerated, and broad-based economic growth. Panelists and participants will share views on how to manage the challenges and opportunities in the areas of equality, competitiveness, employment, privacy, and trust through sound regulatory and legal frameworks and strong institutions. Panelists may be guided by the following general questions to be addressed from a specific sectoral perspective, namely trade and industry, labor, competition policy, finance, the private sector, and the research community. Number one, what recent global developments are creating new challenges? What are the effects of these developments? Number two, can the Philippines navigate through these challenges? What are the country's strengths and weaknesses? Number three, what actions can be taken to enhance adaptation to increasingly integrated yet volatile global economy? Our first speaker, uh, supposed to be Secretary Sylvester Bello. Uh, unfortunately, he will be unable to come here. Instead, uh, under Secretary Siriaco, Lagun Sadi III, He's the Undersecretary of, of Labor Employment, will uh, make the presentation. So may I call on uh, Undersecretary Siriaco Lagun Sadi III to come to the uh, podium, please.
uh, we'll, uh, we'll just uh, call on him later. So, uh, uh, our next speaker will be uh, Ms. Lourdes Ipara Aguirre, the Undersecretary for International Economic Relations, Department of Foreign Affairs. Is she here? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. Um, the, it's really a great pleasure to be with you here at the annual public uh, policy conference of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. And I would like to congratulate PIDS for another well thought out event this year. And also thank you for inviting the Department of Foreign Affairs and for your invitation to me to be a part of this plenary discussion. I am truly honored to be in this panel with eminent policymakers, movers, and uh, shakers. As a government panelist and a senior official of the Philippines to the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, and to the Asia Cooperation Dialogue. I would say that among our foremost challenges is crafting both policy responses and strategic policy initiatives as we navigate through the complexities of globalization in a multilateral cooperative setting. It is challenging enough that globalization has become associated with something that is polarizing as to cause anxiety and pushback and sweeping judgment and discontent from different sectors in society. In the end, it is drawing attention to how economies, people, and enterprises have become increasingly interlinked and interconnected internationally. After all this is what, is what globalization is essentially about, regional and global economic integration that leverages efficiencies and value propositions found among and across the far reaches in every region around the globe. Globalization itself has never been and will never be static. Experts have defined eras and iterations of globalization. And yes, even to arguably include the time when the galleon trade between Manila and Acapulco was at its heyday. At its most transformative stages, globalization has delivered significant progress. In the period up to the turn of the century, globalization enabled the world economy to experience one of its most dynamic expansions of growth. During such period, trade and investment flows have boosted interdependence and allowed developing countries to connect better to the global economy, lifting millions of people out of poverty. As determined by the World Bank, the trade liberalizing impact of globalization would have global trade account for more than 70% of global GDP in 2017, in contrast to a mere 25% in 1960. Online platforms, one of the main tools of the recent iteration of globalization, have opened opportunities for billions of people, generating an unprecedented global exchange of information, 
knowledge, and ideas. This brings me to the crux of what drives and defines globalization. It is connectivity and all the attendant innovations and advances associated with it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of witnessing a profound challenge, a profound change in globalization. Some even would characterize it as scaling back some form of slow-balization or at times de-globalization, a change propelled in no, spot, in no small part by rising protectionism and reversal of standstill commitments and the diverging growth paths of emerging mar markets. This pushback is also having an impact on the underlying premise of multilateralism. For instance, the multilateral trading system, as ex exemplified by the World Trade Organization, or WTO, is the very platform that enables economies to engage bigger economies in a binding rules-based regime. Yet, the WTO is at this very moment under an existential threat and calls are being made across various global forums calling for an affirmation of an open, non-discriminatory, and rules-based trading system. Rather than working together, some countries have resorted to a unilateral advancement of policy goals in response to, or perhaps playing to, the discontent with globalization. Over the years, Multilateralism has lent itself to realities and rationals that serve the common wider good. It has afforded avenues to resolve differences peacefully, platforms to agree on common rules of the game, and mechanisms to better manage international flows, and channels for exchanging ideas, experiences, and practices so that countries learn from each other. Beyond these long-standing rationales, there are new and additional reasons to seek multilateral solutions, especially at addressing new and emergent economic challenges. Globalization 4.0 for connectivity and Industry 4.0 for manufacturing go hand in hand. These twin phenomenon now melds with a combination of economic nationalism, digital integration, and consumer behavior that is ushering in what we call the new globalization, the concept that we have been discussing about today at this annual forum. But globalization, as I mentioned earlier, is never the same at any given time. Moreover, digital integration, integration is accelerating at an unstoppable pace, so much so that the irony presents itself that for every seeming argument against globalization, a catalyst emerges that spurs on a new kind of connectivity that is driving the new and evolving form of globalization. Such digital transformations span national borders. The World Economic Forum holds that digital companies are born global, and the largest of them dominate their market, not only domestically, but globally. These facts add another dimension to the growing interconnectedness between different national economies. This suggests that uncoordinated national rules and policies will not be effective in achieving their goals. International cooperation as a response to new globalization is more crucial now than ever. However, we must all the more be sensitive to address real criticisms and to people's current frustrations and concerns. Ladies and gentlemen, at this juncture, allow me to offer some key areas of policy actions on which President Rodrigo Duterte had first endeavored to draw attention 
at various international conferences to discuss global developments. First, human resource enhancement. He said that we should focus more on investing in human capital development through the enhancement of our basic education systems and skills matching to seamlessly converge with the requirements of our businesses and the demands in our labor markets. These should be complemented with the promotion of science, technology, and research to promote innovation. Second, boosting innovation. At this modern age, innovation is the critical factor of production and the ability to innovate will become more than ever an important element of economic development. Let us support our micro, small, and medium enterprises, or MSMEs, to improve their productivity and enhance the quality of their products and services. Third, infrastructure development. In 2017, the Asian Development Bank posited that Asia needs to invest 1.7 trillion US dollars every year in infrastructure development until the year 2030 to be able to maintain regional economic growth, address poverty, and respond to the growing threat of climate change. The Philippines supports cooperative projects in the region that have seen the construction of international ports, cross-country rail linkages, highways and bridges that not only connect provinces and islands, but entire countries. The Department of Foreign Affairs, the DFA, both here in the Home Office and our 88 Foreign Service posts, is stepping up efforts to increase awareness of the challenge, challenges and opportunities, opportunities posed by the new globalization. Under the One Country Team Approach, or OCTA, OCTA, where the DFA takes the lead in the conduct of economic diplomacy, a critical pillar of the Philippine foreign policy. We are working hand in hand with our partners in government, the other uh, government agencies, and in the private sector, as well as the academe and uh, the business sector, in facilitating the necessary policy shifts and adjustments. We leverage our engagement in bilateral, regional, and multilateral platforms such as ASEAN, APEC, and the UN to realize what is important to the Filipino people, empowerment and inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, I truly believe that this annual policy forum will further inspire more ideas and solutions that will keep the global market community open and innovative, a system that not only contributes to, but leads to global prosperity. Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz succinctly observed that the problem was not globalization, but how the process was being managed. We must be able to present to our people, our stakeholders, a more positive and hopeful narrative and inform them of a future that does not delve on strategy that calls for retreat, but to a way forward that does not overlook the opportunities that present themselves over the horizon. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Under Secretary Iparagire. Um, so may I call on our uh, 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 re the rep Under Secretary Siriaco Lagunsa III, who is uh, representing um, Secretary Bello. Thank you for the introduction. On behalf of Secretary Sylvester Bellio, uh, let me extend the warm greetings of uh, his greetings, the department's greetings, 
congratulations to PIDS and NEDA for a successful annual uh, conference. Let me greet uh, our dignitaries, uh, Secretary Ernesto Pernia, uh, NEDA Secretary, Celio Reyes, President of BIDS, Mr. Calixto Chiquiamco, our moderator, of course, Under Secretary Lourdes Iparaguirre of the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, Arsenio Balisacan, the chair of the Philippine Competition uh, Commission, his former Socioeconomic Planning Secretary, Deputy Governor Francisco Daquila Jr. of the Banco Central of the Philippines, Mr. Gerardo Siket, uh, a, a professor emeritus of the UP School of Economics, Mr. Alfredo Pascual, President of the Institute of Corporate Directors, and later on, I think Senator Aquilino Pimentel will join us. Uh, colleagues from government, our social partners from the business sectors, academic and civil society organizations, distinguished guests and participants, good afternoon. We are witnessing a transformation of globalization from its traditional definition to being shaped by combination of governance decisions and technological advancements. The interrelated challenges are brought by technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, and the Internet of Things, combined with global trade restructuring, social inequality, and political tensions give rise to its complexity. It is not managed well. This can undermine the country's development vision encapsulated in Ambition 2040 and our targets under the Sustainable Development Goals. The globalization will surely reshape the world of work. The work has gotten bigger and smaller. Bigger because companies continue to move into emerging markets and smaller because of increased connectivity. One simple way to think of new globalization in the world of work is about digitally enabled and transformed workplaces. While work organization will greatly improve because of technology, it is also put into question how the workforce will face the challenges, especially technological advancements. The risk of automation depends on one's occupation. Young Filipinos are facing high risk due to the automation of jobs the study shows. In the Future of Jobs 2018 report by the World Economic Forum, most companies in the Philippines are likely to hire new staff with skills relevant to new technologies, and 80% are likely to retain their current employees. However, 74% are expecting their employees to pick up necessary skills and knowledge on the job. Amid the growing influence of automation and artificial intelligence, there are rising skills that are most sought after by employers from applicants. This includes social media marketing, front-end web development, and human-centered design. Many discussions revolve on how the workforce can maximize opportunities while mitigating the risk on the future of labor market. For the department, all endeavors have been geared towards the achievement of inclusive growth, to which the promotion and realization of decent work is at the forefront. The department recognizes the importance of updated labor market information, or LMI. Dole released the Labor Market Information Report 2022, enumerating the industries that will create jobs and skills. A good LMI will enable to effectively link skills, demand, and supply, leading to good decisions as it benefits the individual, the businesses, and the economy. According to ILO, 13% of the ASEAN labor force will be aged 15 to 24 in 2030, providing our youth with timely and accurate labor market signals 
would enable them to prepare and harness their potential to its fullest by establishing strong foundations during their education. Dole's facilitation of career guidance advocacy program, uh, or CGAP, work in both ways. Responsive LMI will empower students in making informed career decisions while career advocates, career counselors, and training institutions to come up with strategies to further increase the potentials of the current and future members of the labor force. Investments in youth is a proactive response to current, current labor trends and demographic shifts. To make our youth more competitive in the future labor market, education is crucial in laying the foundation of the 21st century skills. While reading, writing, and numeracy used to be the foundational skills, they have grown to encompass social and emotional skills and digital literacy. The Job Start Philippines, Dole's flagship program, to address youth unemployment, one of its components is life skills training to become more responsive to the demands of job market and better integration opportunities into productive employment. Aside from automation, there are drastic changes in the overall business landscape, such as new work arrangements and emerging jobs. This may require upskilling, reskilling, and retooling of workforce, especially of the technical and vocational and educational training programs. Updated educational and training tools and approaches that utilize new technologies are essential to equip workers with the skills that they need to succeed in an ever-changing economy. It seems that the new world of work is about skills. The demand for higher level skills is strong. The opportunities afforded by technology should be used to reimagine 21st century education and training. During the 108th session of the International Labor Conference, we stress that the main task at hand is to craft policies that affirm human incomparability and assert the importance of tripartism and social dialogue amid transformations in the world of work brought about by automation and digital technology. Even before Dole has institutionalized tripartism in, in policy development, the shift in the world of work is surely creating winners and losers. Continuous collaboration, tripartite partnership between the government workers and employers supported with our social partners can make us adaptive to the changing world of work. Aside from the passage of numerous landmark laws protecting rights and promotion of the welfare of Filipino workers and their families, Dole is committed and is full accord to achieve the the targets embodied in the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly on decent work, uh, ensuring no one will be displaced from the jobs to be left behind. While we recognize the rapidly changing work, world of work and welcoming pioneering new technologies, new jobs and opportunities, this phase is an opportune time for us policymakers to ask tough Questions. We must bear in mind that those who will be affected of, by transition are least equipped or vulnerable workers that need our support. They must be equipped with proper skills and provide social protection policies to address market imperfections. On the other hand, we must remain vigilant if new technologies will serve their purpose of making work efficient rather creating controls or would we further widen the gap of social inequalities and poverty. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Our next speaker uh, is uh, the current chairman of the Philippine Competition Com Commission and the f a former uh, socioeconomic planning secretary. Um, he will uh, talk on. Uh, yes. Uh, May I call on uh, R.C. Balisakan. Thank you, uh, Dottie. I was so pleased to learn new things today uh, in, on this topic. And uh, these new things for me are summarized in VUCA. Uh, the challenges uh, arising from this so-called new globalization, vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Meeting those challenges also require buka. In the words of uh, uh, President, uh, PIDS President Celia Reyes, uh, vision, unity, consultation, adaptability. I hope I get right. Um, and in the other sessions, uh, during the parallel sessions, there were discussions about uh, inequality, poverty, and globalization, technological disruptions. And one of the uh, uh, policy suggestions uh, uh, arising from those discussions was the need for uh, more aggressive, more robust uh, uh, competition policy. And I, I will focus my uh, uh, discussion in the uh, minutes that I have. Um, in the next slide, let me start with Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate Stiglitz, when uh, he said in his uh, New York Times uh, opinion piece uh, earlier this year that the weakening of antitrust enforcement and the failure of regulation to keep up with the changes in our economy, obviously referring to the American economy, and the innovations in creating and leveraging market power meant that markets became more concentrated and less competitive. And he went on to say that markets don't exist in a vacuum. They have to be structured by rules and regulations, and those rules and regulations must be enforced. Okay. Let me take you back to some of the uh, narratives that we heard uh, earlier today. Uh, since 2000, the Philippine economy has been one of the fastest growing emerging economies in Asia. You can see that those in the decadal uh, uh, com uh, figures there, um, comparing the Philippines where you see this um, uh, decade average, uh, uh, averages rising for the Philippines uh, and has become one of the fastest uh, 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 in these emerging economies. But there has been, uh, there have been some serious concerns about the sustainability of the growth because in, in economic history, we find that when growth is not inclusive, that growth is not likely to be sustainable. Many um, countries have experienced um, uh, economic stagnation after the uh, episodes of, of growth because that growth have, uh, has not been inclusive. If you look at the Philippines, there are indeed some disturbing patterns. Uh, for example, real wages hardly changed uh, uh, during, uh, since uh, the late 1990s, uh, whereas average uh, productivity, labor productivity, has risen along with the uh, size of the pie, the economic pie. 
And if you look at the most basic uh, uh, metric for, uh, for progress, which is the, up, the reduction in the absolute deprivation or poverty, you find that uh, given the level of growth that we have seen in the last 10 to 15 years, the rate of poverty reduction, is, especially in the sense of absolute poverty uh, uh, reduction, has been so, uh, so slow compared to what other countries in, our, in, in Asia, particularly in our neighbors, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, and China, of course, uh, have experienced. Um, but we see a bit of, uh, we see a ray of hope in the last uh, uh, five to eight years. Uh, for example, we find that uh, in the 2012 to 2015, we see a quite a, a robust uh, a reduction in that poverty, uh, which is very encouraging. And uh, in the discussion earlier today, uh, in the, in the par parallel uh, discussion, uh, there was this uh, uh, view that the 2018 numbers, poverty numbers, when it comes out, it will likely show a significant reduction in poverty, despite the high inflation in the late 1980s. And I also believe that that's so. I would be very, very surprised uh, if, if uh, uh, the numbers would not show a substantial reduction in that poverty. So there's some, some uh, rays uh, of hope that uh, this time it's going to be different. And, and we must uh, ensure that it is really going to be different and competition policy is just one of that uh, 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 need. Of course, the, the patterns of inequality that we have seen, patterns of poverty are caused by so many factors. Competition policy uh, or the lack of it is just one of them. But what is disturbing, and I, and I would like to point out why competition policy is such a uh, uh, commands uh, high attention uh, in our case that if you look at, uh, at the indicators of market concentration in the Philippines, you find that markets are highly concentrated in the Philippines more so than many other countries in our region. Uh, you find more incident, more markets are <clears throat> uh, ruled by monopolies, duopolies uh, in the Philippines than you find in our neighbors like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Cambodia, according to the World Bank uh, uh, estimates, and if you find, uh, you see also the the the, the right-hand part of that slide, you find uh, the Philippines uh, being portrayed as as a, a uh, as a country where markets are highly uh, dominated compared to to other countries, um, and and if you look at how regulations, uh, uh, various uh, instruments of, of, of policy, uh, including those that you see in the, man, in the charters uh, or statutes of, of agencies, sector regulators, and, the fine, and so on and so forth, you find that, that the uh, uh, product market regulation is, uh, is quite, uh, uh, or the competition is quite uh, restrictive in the Philippines, more so than uh, than uh, uh, compared to its, uh, the country's peers. So there are indications, very serious indications, that, that we certainly need more, more uh, competition uh, and not less competition in this country. But obviously for any stu students of economics uh, uh, would know what uh, competition policy is all about. It's about, it's not, competition policy is not about being anti-market. On the other hand, competition policy is being about enhancing the ability of markets to deliver market, uh, economic welfare. That's, uh, and that economic welfare can be assured if those, uh, those markets deliver lower prices for goods and services, uh, deliver more choices for, uh, for uh, consumers, uh, better quality goods and services, and it, uh, competition also uh, uh, lead to faster or greater innovation. And I would like to point that in the, in, uh, in the Philippines, uh, uh, this is one of the countries where competition policy has been inscribed in our uh, Philippine development, in the government development plan. No? Uh, 
Uh, so, and its competition policy is part and parcel of the whole development strategy uh, aimed at achieving uh, and sustaining rapid and inclusive growth. So competition policy should not be seen in isolation. It should be seen in conjunction with other uh, uh, policies if we want competition policy to succeed uh, in its uh, objective. Now, I said earlier, market power. Markets are so highly concentrated in the, in the Philippines, and highly concentrated markets always b oh, come, uh, brings about market power. And that market power, in the experiences of OECD countries, has led to further increases in wealth concentration. Uh, and a, a, nearly a fifth of the wealth uh, inequality that you find in these countries comes from for the, or as, is associated with that uh, uh, market power. So uh, the, the, Fili the Philippine Competition Commission, a new, very new uh, young or, or, uh, agency, just a, a three, uh, three and a half year agency, is given the mandate to, uh, to uh, enf enforce uh, prohibitions against uh, uh, anti-competitive practices, whether these are in the form of agreements like cartels, abuses of dominant position, or anti-competitive mergers and acquisitions. We do also a lot of advocacy work for, uh, uh, for government. Now, just my last, last slide, I just want to point out that the, the priorities for enforcement and advocacy that we have set for ourselves are precisely those sectors that are very challenging from the point of view of concentration and market power, and especially those sectors that have uh, uh, that don't face the competitive pressure from imports, and I'm talking about non-traded sectors like telecommunications, electricity, transportation, construction, um, also retail and commerce. Uh, but we are also looking closely at, uh, uh, we'll give priority also to food, food manufacturing, uh, health and pharmaceutical, uh, because as you know, in this country, food and, and, and medicine, uh, uh, pharmaceutical products are uh, very, very expensive in this country compared to uh, our neighbors. And obviously, we would want to understand or we would want to see whether those have to do with uh, anti-competitive practices or, uh, or uh, something else. So we, we have chosen this, these sectors on the basis of their potential impact on consumers and the probability of, uh, of uh, uh, informant su success and the legislative priorities that are uh, also um, um, identified by the government. Now, given the VASO or VUCA, uh, we certainly need to rethink and refine and re reframe our, our economics, uh, our, uh, our, co our competition policy, because the, uh, if the economics that as we know it, as we, I learned at least in graduate school, is, is uh, not the kind of economics that you, 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 you need in this kind of, of, of game. Because, for example, I mean, many of these markets, marginal cost is zero. You use Google, or marginal price is zero, or price is zero. You know? So what are we talking about when price is zero? Why is, that, why is anti competitive when, it's, when the price is zero? So things like that. It's, there are, uh, no one says that we have to uh, uh, ensure that we understand fully the, those complexities introduced by big tech. And we definitely need, need to work closely with sector regulators and other government agencies. And in an effort to, to speed up uh, our ability to, uh, to uh, enforce the, our mandate, we work and we are uh, working closely with uh, other competition authorities around the world, particularly in more mature uh, competition authorities. So with that, I assure you that uh, the, uh, the, competition, the PCC will also do its uh, part of the, uh, of the work to, uh, to make these uh, uh, this, uh, uh, dynamic markets uh, uh, beneficial and, and workable for the Philippine economy. Thank you. Thank you, RC. Uh, um, I, will, I will no longer, um, in introducing the speaker, I will not uh, no longer 
give uh, their long resumes. It's already in your program. So uh, now uh, may we call on our next speaker, uh, Francisco Daquila Jr., the Deputy Governor of the Monetary and Economic Sector of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Good afternoon. And I'd like to thank the PIDS for this very kind invitation to serve as a panelist. Um, the topic is navigating the new globalization. Um, coming from the monetary policy side of the BSP, let me say a few words on the impact and the challenges posed by globalization on the monetary policy framework. With increasing globalization and interconnectedness of financial markets, capital flow movements have been a concern of central banks, particularly those of emerging market economies. The inflation targeting framework in emerging market economies has generally been successful. Inflation targeting uh, as practiced by EMEs has often been combined with varying degrees of foreign exchange intervention contrary to what you see in uh, textbook discussions together with the active use of macroprudential tools due mainly to the following reasons. First, emerging economies are more sensitive to capital flows and exchange rate movements owing to their economic and financial structures. And second, foreign exchange intervention and macroprudential measures can ease the burden on monetary policy. Capital flows and associated exchange rate fluctuations affect macroeconomic and financial stability in EMEs through three main channels. One, the exchange rate pass through to inflation. Two, export competitiveness. And three, domestic financial conditions. While exchange rate pass through has declined, uh, so, for example, in the Philippines, we see that if you cut the sample to before the introduction of inflation targeting and post-inflation um, targeting, the sensitivity of inflation to exchange rate movements is only about one-third of what it was pre-inflation targeting. But on the other hand, um, emerging market economies are often subject to larger exchange rate swings. So that when you look at the contribution of exchange rate to inflation, uh, it still remains significant. Large swings in the exchange rate, and especially large depreciations, you still have the potential to de-anchor inflation expectations. Um, there also is a short-term trade-off between inflation and output stability, two broad indicators of overall welfare. For instance, a capital outflow accompanied by a depreciation could push up inflation through the exchange rate pass through. But on the other hand, the impact on output through the traditional trade channel, including uh, through export competitiveness, can be um, 
offset by the structural constraints faced by the economy in the short term. Likewise, domestic financial conditions could tighten, exerting a contractionary effect on the domestic economy. As a result, the central bank may face the combination of rising inflation and the weak economy. And two structural features make EMEs possibly vulnerable. First, EME borrowers could rely heavily on foreign currency borrowing, which may be often unhedged. Second, foreign investors have large holdings of EME assets, particularly bonds. Another important corollary issue arising from globalization is inequality. The conventional view is that globalization benefits society as a whole, but more so the poor. In the early 2000s, an NBER paper found that inequality among countries has been on the decline since 1990, reflecting more rapid economic growth in developing countries due in part to trade liberalization. However, in a later empirical investigation by the IMF, um, it was shown that a key factor in determining how inequality changes in countries over time is technology. To the extent that technological change favors those with higher skills and exacerbates the skills gap, it could adversely affect the distribution of income in both developing and advanced economies by reducing the demand for lower skill activities and increasing the premium for higher skill activities and the returns to capital. The finding of a small net negative impact of globalization on inequality is a result of the opposing influences of different components of globalization. Globalization uh, through trade has exerted an equalizing impact whereas financial globalization has been associated with widening income disparities. And with that as a backdrop, I segue to the main topic, which is because we're talking now of uh, technology, how do we leverage on fintech innovations for financial inclusion? In this um, short presentation, I will be discussing the benefits and risks of fintech and the possible implications on the BSP's monetary policy making and the stability of the financial system of our country. And I will present the BSP's regulatory framework, how we try to leverage on these innovations while managing the risks with red tech solutions. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Fintech developments present both benefits and risks. These innovations have allowed for lower costs of transactions, greater accessibility to funds and increased speed, efficiency, and convenience in value transfers and payments. With some of the innovations, lenders and borrowers have more direct and immediate access to each other. By directly linking lenders with borrowers, alternative lending platforms avoid mismatched maturities and may lead to more stable credit environment. And yet, these same platforms that simplify and facilitate transactions also present risks. In particular, there can arise concerns on consumer protection and financial stability. There is the possibility of fraud and breakdown in the payments or lending platforms that can lead to the loss of funds of consumers and or the improper use of personal data, as we have seen lately when we uh, look at uh, uh, um, 
breaches of uh, um, information in uh, uh, some uh, uh, social uh, media platforms. Now, most of these uh, fintech innovations are outside the regulatory reach of monetary and financial authorities, and there may not be defined rights and obligations for the parties involved, especially with respect to cross-border transactions. With the wider usage, the risks would not be limited to the users of the services, but can spread and affect the mainstream financial system. Likewise, the ease of use and opacity of transactions may unsuspectingly facilitate money laundering and terrorist financing. Fintechs are disrupting the financial ecosystem in the next slide in the sense that they are able to disband, unbundle, and reassemble financial services. They have been providing intermediary services that provide solutions to many customers, whether households or corporations. And this adds complexity to the role of regulators. Most fintech innovations are on the payment system. They allow peer-to-peer -peer value exchange without the involvement of trusted third parties like banks. And the evidence so far suggests that while fintech companies are very useful, they can also bypass the services of banks and possibly create incentives for shadow banking. The framework espoused by the BSP is to promote synergy between fintech companies and banks so that the financial transactions between these two entities will still be under the regulatory ambit of the central bank. So in the third next slide, in view of the above mentioned potential benefits and risks, monetary and financial regulators need to have a balanced approach to risks and growth by keeping pace with the latest developments in the financial markets, promoting innovations and healthy competition, while at the same time addressing consumer protection issues and managing financial stability risks. Um, in the BSP, we have established a regulatory environment that allows innovations to flourish, but at the same time ensures that risks are effectively managed. Thus, the approach is threefold. To ensure that regulations are risk-based, proportionate, and fair. To maintain active, multi-stakeholder collaboration and third, to ensure consumer protection. And these principles are implemented through a flexible test and learn approach, or what we usually call the regulatory sandbox. Um, fintech market players in the next slide include non-financial firms, tech companies and network operators, for example, that are not regulated by the BSP. So proper regulation, therefore, requires coordination with other regulators. And in this respect, um, in August of 2018, the Financial Sector Forum, composed of the SEC, the Insurance Commission, the PDIC, and the BSP, formed a FinTech committee aimed at harmonizing regulatory responses to FinTech innovation in the sector. At the regional level, the BSP has recently entered into collaboration with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, conveying information sharing and referral system specifically focused on fintechs. Um, next slide. Fintech also promotes financial inclusion to a large extent due to the wide reach of mobile penetration in the Philippines. Fintech arrangements not only make financial services accessible to customers in remote, hard-to-reach areas, but are also able to reduce costs by passing on to customers the lower transactions costs of Fintech. Hence, digital solutions promote financial inclusion by reaching 
the unserved and underserved markets in a large scale. The BSP in the next slide is also undertaking major organizational reforms and initiatives for a more proactive supervisory and regulatory stance. We are exploring red tech and subtech solutions, including the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud computing, and application programming interface systems to enhance the timeliness and quality of risk-based decision-making. Um, next slide. The BSP, together with industry stakeholders, launched the National Retail Payment System to enable more Filipinos to have access to a transaction account to send and to receive payments. The NRPS, with its interoperability objective and the payment ecosystem that is envisioned to arise from it, is positioned to be a platform for more fintech innovations. In summary, in this final slide, central banks in general are responding proactively to fintech by monitoring developments in financial technology, expending resources to get a grasp of technological change, and developing and adopting a regulatory framework to implement and study fintech in a safe environment. The key challenge for regulatory agencies is to create the right balance. A regulator should be prepared to appropriately tailor uh, regulatory or supervisory expectations to the extent possible within the respective authorities to facilitate innovations that produce benefits for customers, businesses, and the financial system, but must also appropriately manage corresponding risks. So, with that, um, I uh, uh, thank again the organizers for this uh, opportunity to talk before you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Daquila. Uh, our, for our next speaker uh, is uh, a prof Professor Emeritus of the UP School of Economics and the, and the first uh, uh, socioeconomic planning secretary of the Philippines, may be called on uh, Professor Jerry Sikat. Dr. Sikat is not yet here. Uh, therefore, uh, we'll proceed to the next speaker, um, uh, Mr. Alfred, Alfredo Pascual, the president of the Institute of Corporate Directors. Good afternoon to all. I'll spend the next uh, few minutes talking about the opportunities and challenges faced by the private sector players in the evolving digital economy. To be able to tap business opportunities in the evolving digital economy, Digital transformation is key. This must be done or else a company will be left behind. The most successful businesses are the ones that constantly evolve and reinvent themselves to keep pace with advances in the outside world. 
We all know the story. The life of human beings is uh, lengthening, but the life of business corporations are shortening uh, because of the changes that's going on in the environment. We have to learn the lessons from natural selection. The most successful life forms evolve greatly, like us, the people in this room, based on the principles of vari variation, selection, and replication. A number of big companies in the Philippines have already moved or are moving on the road to digital transformation. Those that do business with consumers and other customers, in particular, have an accumulation of data that can and are being captured and organized into databases. This enables the power of data to be harnessed through datafication and analyzed through big data analytics. And this process is meant to support more targeted marketing, improve operating efficiencies, detect fraud, measure performance, and develop new products and services. Another purpose of digital transformation and harnessing of data is to achieve agility in areas of the company's business that are vulnerable to disruption. Besides, in the digital age, companies need to be transformed or be disrupted. A data-driven company will be agile enough to adapt and adjust to a constantly changing business environment. A research scientist, Gene Ross of MIT, pointed out, quote, unlike past business success, success in the digital economy it's not so much about brilliant strategy. It's about being able to execute constantly changing strategy. The goal is to move from a world that is stable around current processes to one designed by agility. The bigger and more established companies are among the first to embrace digital transformation However, small and medium enterprises, or SMEs, are also following closely. Especially so are SMEs led by the younger, more dynamic, and tech-savvy entrepreneurs. The Philippine startup community, not only in Manila, but in other key cities of the country, is growing and expanding. And these companies, whose basic business models are dependent on digital technology are proof that digital transformation is critical in the, in the age of the fourth industrial revolution. Small businesses do not have the advantage, though, of the big businesses. Unlike big corporations, small businesses can make huge, unlike big businesses or corporations that can make huge outlays to roll out digital transformation, and these are capital-intensive undertakings, small businesses do not have the resources. But small businesses have the alternative of other means, like subscribing to cloud services instead of buying big-ticket software. The Philippines is still far from reaching the technological capabilities of its neighboring countries, particularly Singapore and Malaysia. But with access to the right and reliable tools, Philippine businesses will soon follow the consumer trend of integrating technology in everyday lives. They have to deal with customers who are the most users of uh, social media and uh, who stay the longest, you know, online. In the era of globalization 4.0, where giants like Amazon and Alibaba are expanding internationally and have their sites 
on emerging markets like the Philippines, local companies starting up in the country must use every advantage at their disposal to gain traction and stay competitive. Before they attempt to scale, they must attract enough momentum to survive, to validate their product and prove their business model. Consequently, many startups naturally focus on creating localized products or services that capitalize on their advantages and what are these advantages, time and space. The SMEs producing goods have of course the alternative of availing the e-commerce platforms of the global players for gaining access and selling their products in the global market. Here are some examples of digital startups in the Philippines. You've heard of PayMaya, a Philippine-based online mobile app that allows Filipinos to pay without having to use cash or credit card. Then there is uh, Senya, another AI-based on-demand mobile platform that offers smart health and wellness services to clients in the Philippines. These services are ordered and booked through mobile, mobile devices. The services are provided by highly skilled and carefully vetted practitioners. Senya has launched in Singapore, Bangkok, Hong Kong, and other parts of Asia after its success in Manila. The Philippines is now moving to have a grocery delivery service of its own in the form of an online startup going by the name of Pushcart. Ph. The company has partnered with Lalamove, an international expert logistics company, to deliver goods in the best condition at the customer's doorsteps. Currently, the company is serving in Manila, but soon expected to expand uh, elsewhere outside the country. The last one I'd like to highlight is Ancas. For those of you who are on the road every day, going back, going and coming back from office, you would see the Ancas helmet with the, the driver and the passenger. They also have a service called Ancas Padala for delivery. They are using motorbikes. The fourth industrial revolution will bring huge benefits such as empowering SMEs in creating new ways to connect and provide local residents with payment, healthcare, and transport services. Equally, it will bring tremendous challenges, such as deep disruptions to jobs as AI and advanced robotics undermine both manufacturing and services jobs. In the era of the fourth industrial revolution, opportunities for SMEs are tremendous, but many SMEs are limited by their ability to grow because of lack of access to finance, business services, and information, and constrained access to markets beyond their immediate neighborhood. However, the rise of digital marketplaces and online services can empower SMEs to trade in ways unimaginable even a few years ago, connecting them to giant regional markets rather than just local customers. Technologies such as blockchain will revolutionize payments and logistics enabling small firms to interact on trusted basis despite never having met each other. The four IR promises to unleash a world of micro-transactions. There is also the opportunity to leapfrog development challenges. Technologies of the four IR create the opportunity for developing countries like the Philippines to bypass traditional phases of industrial development. Mobile phones, for example, have already reduced the need for countries to lay expensive fixed landlines in remote areas. Online mobile banking is already here. Localized renewable energy production, such as solar power coupled with new battery storage technology, can reduce the need for investing in expensive power distribution networks. Drones could help to deliver lightweight, high-value goods such as medical supplies to remote regions. Based on the assessment of the Economist Intelligence Unit, the Philippines stepped out 
of the blue in 2018, that means last year, and boom as an Asian country prepared to embrace technological advance. The Philippines ranked 55th among 82 countries listed. It has been deemed that the Philippines is welcoming to technological domain steadily. However, in the Philippines still, cash rules the land. That is why Lazada was able to penetrate the market only after it decided to accept COD payments from its online shoppers in the country. But the rain is shifting to the e-payment methods in the coming times. The Philippines will become a cashless nation where the concept of cash and plastic cards will vanish in thin air. However, despite all the excitement, most businesses have yet to embrace digital strategies at the same high level of internet, internet use by the population. There are barriers to the way forward. And what are these barriers? First, availability of affordable, high-speed internet. In the country, the broadband market is dominated by two large firms, soon to be three. Reforms that promote competition could help lower prices and increase bandwidth speed. Keep your fingers crossed. Second, the need to strengthen the population's digital skills. Next month, DepEd National, Liter National Liter Literacy Council will hold a conference aligning 21st century literacies to Industry 4.0. I will keynote this uh, particular conference. Third barrier, the need to expand the use of digital payments, an essential part of a digital economy. I'm glad to hear that the BSP is on the way to setting up this national retail payment system. Fourth barrier, especially for e-commerce, high cost and, and unpredictable logistics. Fifth, policies that promote trust have to be brought about to improve or to increase the participation in the digital economy. This cover a range of areas from data privacy to cybersecurity to counter or to consumer protection. And six, not necessarily the last, six on my list, the government needs to lead by example and become more digital themselves. So these barriers would represent the obstacles to our way forward in the evolving digital economy, and I hope our policymakers and government uh, people will be able to address these barriers. Thank you. Uh, we will have the open forum afterwards, uh, but uh, before that, um, I will uh, address one question each to our panel. Um, to uh, Under Secretary Dagunslad III, um, how can the public and private sector work together to ensure skills matching for the Filipino workforce? Thank you. The, unfortunately, there's always a lag between preparing the supply and the actual need. So the, I think the key there is to anticipate. But that is becoming a difficult task. You do not know what's, what's really going to happen. So a very good way is to be close to the ground, understanding the developments in technology and the kind of work that would be demanded in the future. and then feed that back to the, the educational system. TESDA is now preparing for the fourth industrial revolution, anticipating that the, the skill requirements are, are different. Um, other than that, it's, it's really uh, predicting what would be in demand. Otherwise, you would have created skills that may never be required in the future. So there is a concept of creating skills. There is also 
this destroying skills. So skills that cannot be applied are, are rendered, you know, destroyed in that sense. So that's a lot of waste in the resources. So that is why it's, a, a, it's not really just the companies determining what they require, but coordinating closely with the educational system from, from, Ch to, from DepEd to CHED to TESDA, and, and closely the academic industry linkage has to be as, as, as close as possible so that, as I said, uh, we can anticipate uh, the future demand of work. Thank you. Uh, to Chairman Balisakan, uh, as you know, I'm also a tech entrepreneur, and I, uh, I noticed that most uh, companies here are resistant to change. And I think uh, one observation is that, uh, as you said, uh, we have a concentrated market, and uh, most companies don't feel they have to change. So what are the specific uh, policies that are what you think that we have to push us to, uh, you know, uh, force companies to innovate, to, 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 to be more ready for change? Uh, okay. Um, I think the uh, most serious uh, uh, constraint uh, to competition here are, are uh, barriers to entry. Um, uh, and these barriers to entry uh, will usually result in uh, that, that creation of, uh, or uh, will, will create uh, creates that uh, market power that I, I, I mentioned earlier. And that market power, when it is exercised, uh, 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 leads to concentration of, of, uh, uh, of wealth and concentration of opportunities. Uh, there is so much evidence already in the literature showing that when this, uh, 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 when uh, big companies uh, used uh, uh, their bigness or their dominance in the market to uh, abuse their uh, th that market power by imposing or making it uh, difficult for potential competitors or even their incumbent uh, competitors to uh, to compete with them and by for example by uh, uh, by forcibly buying them or forcibly underpricing them and, and <coughs> That uh, will reduce the uh, competition that, and the, uh, the usual uh, consequence of that is, of course, higher prices, poorer quality uh, of services, less choices, uh, less innovation. So clearly, uh, uh, government um, in, in this, especially in this kind of markets, dynamic markets, uh, must have to play a role in ensuring that markets, uh, the, the, the potential benefits of markets are enhanced rather than restricted. Uh, and here, I, I, I keep emphasizing the barriers to entry. The barriers to entry are very per pernicious in this uh, country. Uh, that barriers to entry are either done by, uh, uh, by the firms themselves or even worse, in, in most settings I presented here, these are created we, through uh, through government rules, uh, government regulations, uh, government policies, because that power, that market power, also brings with it the power to influence public policy. And that, one, that public policy, it, when they get it, they, it reinforces the, the, that market power even more and the concentration of industry. So that has to be broken. That link has to be broken. And as Stiglitz uh, uh, rightly noted, uh, you, you need to have a, 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 a vigorous, robust uh, uh, competition and regulatory enforcement regime. Thank you, RC. Uh, Undersecretary Ipara Aguirre, uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, investing in human resources to cope up with the, you know, the rapid technological change. Uh, what does uh, DFA uh, in, 
how does the FAA in particular uh, invest in its own human resources to be able to uh, um, keep up with the uh, changes uh, that technologies bring about? Um, thank you. Um, we are, of course, retooling our diplomats uh, so that we can better understand um, the challenges and opportunities uh, in the digital economy um, so that we can continue uh, to promote uh, the economic interests of the Philippines uh, abroad and as well as protect uh, these interests. Um, there are now, of course, a uh, changing env environment uh, when we deal with our partners uh, in terms of um, trade, investments, tourism. Um, we have to compete uh, in the digital economy. Our priority interest, of course, our mantra, catchword for us, uh, for the DFA and our partner agencies, is to pursue, promote, an inclusive globalization. Uh, for example, for MSMEs, uh, our micro, small, and medium enterprises, which accounts for about 97 to 99 percent of enterprises uh, in the Philippines, that means that is the backbone of our uh, economy. Um, we, of course, uh, promote the interests of MSMEs to ensure greater participation uh, of MSMEs in the global economy and to ensure their access um, to finance, technology, and uh, the marketplace. Um, so this month, actually, or next month, early next month, we have a conference of our heads of posts uh, all over the world. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have 88 posts uh, all over the world. and. Um, one of the major topics that will be discussed in this conference is the digital economy. So that um, uh, our diplomats uh, abroad, the heads of posts, and their team, Team Philippines, uh, will be able to work together. Because working together uh, with the other agencies, then we are better. Uh, we need to work harder because we have um, ambitious targets uh, under our development plans, under Ambition 2040. Uh, we have to work harder uh, in the digital economy because we have to understand the opportunities and also address the challenges uh, for the Filipino people. We have to work harder and better because we need to catch up with uh, the high achieving uh, ASEAN or ASEAN neighbors. And uh, we need to work harder and better um, because uh, we need to attract more investments for our ambitious projects, such as uh, uh, the Build, Build, Build uh, infrastructure project. So in all of these activities, uh, our diplomats abroad uh, play a key role. And uh, we use uh, the various platforms, bilateral, regional and multilateral, again, to promote and protect our, our economic interests abroad. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Deputy Governor uh, Dakila, uh, a number of uh, rural banks are actually uh, have been closed or are closing, and they are the, in the front lines of extending countries, uh, uh, credit to the countryside. And yet, of course, we say that we want to promote financial inclusion. How can uh, rural banks compete with the big banks, uh, especially now with uh, fintech? Actually, uh, fintech as a tool is probably uh, to the advantage of uh, smaller banks because uh, it's less capital intensive. And it's very much suited to the needs of our uh, economy. Um, as you know, um, we are uh, an archipelagic country. So in many uh, remote areas, 
it's really not economic to be putting up the traditional uh, bank branches, the brick and mortar, uh, uh, mortar uh, type of uh, 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 setup. Um, there's a, there are large uh, fixed uh, costs. So um, FinTech can reduce the uh, cost of bringing banking services to um, the uh, poorer uh, sectors of the economy, to the more uh, remote uh, areas of the economy. And um, they can, uh, uh, they can uh, uh, make use of this uh, technology. Um, we've also um, uh, embarked on some uh, activities that would um, make it uh, easier for the um, uh, public to uh, access the uh, banking system. Uh, for example, we have uh, reduced the identification uh, requirements and this will be um, further enhanced once we have the national ID system because uh, it will just require one, uh, one document, one ID, uh, for you to establish your uh, identity. Uh, so again, uh, all of these uh, technologies, rather than, um, rather than placing uh, um, rural banks or uh, smaller banks into a disadvantage, they can be used by uh, uh, our uh, smaller banks. Of course, uh, we have a liberalized uh, entry into uh, the banking system. So um, if, uh, if, if a bank um, feels that uh, <clears throat> its uh, scale of, uh, uh, of uh, business is too low, it's free to merge with uh, other banks so as to um, uh, achieve a more uh, uh, yes, uh, achieve the advantage of uh, economies of uh, scale. It can even uh, attract uh, foreign capital because uh, foreign, foreign capital can now go into uh, a rural bank. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Governor Dakila. Uh, Mr. Fred Pasqual, as you know, uh, uh, Indonesia has three unicorns. And uh, one of them, uh, Go Gojek, Gojek. Uh, is even in that 10 to 15 billion dollar range, while the Philippines has none, zero. What do you account for this uh, disparity? Uh, they have more enterprising uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, but anyway, I, I just want to respond the quest on, to the question on rural banks. Uh, I'd like to point out that the Union Bank is trying to organize the rural banks and link them to uh, facilitate their joint operation through the use of blockchain. Anyway, why Gocek succeeded in uh, Indonesia? Well, firstly, Indonesia has a much bigger market. And uh, I think the big business in Indonesia the big businesses are much bigger than the ones in the Philippines. So if Gojek has the backing of, uh, of uh, big business there, then it's expected to be uh, well, well uh, able to, to grow. In fact, it has been acquiring uh, locally established fintech companies. Uh, it has acquired a, share, a stake in uh, coins.ph, for example. Uh, I have not really looked at uh, in detail their operation, but uh, I suspect that uh, well, their, their their home base is a bigger market. You know, in business you first have to grow big in your own market. You know, this is the the old formula for emerging markets. Still the case. You know, we cannot at once leapfrog to the global market, and 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 they were able to grow big first in Indonesia before moving outside. But we have companies that are moving outside. I pointed out uh, at least one. Anybody close to being a unicorn? Anybody close to be, be, being a unicorn? 
Are you the court? <laughs> I think I think we're waiting for a black swan. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but no, no, but uh, kidding aside, I think uh, we have here the FinTech, we have two FinTech groups, you know, FinTech Philippines and FinTech Alliance. And uh, I've signed an agreement already with one, FinTech uh, Philippines will be signing an agreement with FinTech Alliance next week in order to, you know, for the Institute of Corporate Directors to help them in their uh, governance challenges and uh, hopefully we can guide them uh, as well, you know, in the growth of their uh, business. Thank you. So uh, we will have an open forum. Um, uh, anybody is free to uh, go to the mic. Uh, please identify yourself and um, uh, address your question to the person you want to answer. Uh, sir, good afternoon. I'm Grace Magalso Bualat from University of San Carlos, Cebu City. I would want to focus on the impact of globalization on education. Like, for example, in the tertiary level, we actually have a course on globalization. We call it the contemporary world. That is one of the reforms initiated by CMO 20 series of 2013. But I would like to focus on the K-12 educational reform. One of the promises of the reform is for the K-12 graduates to be hired after they finish the K-12 program. My question is, do we see in the near future the industry or company or the community of practice, are they willing to hire the graduates of K-12 even if they did not proceed to the tertiary level? So do we see that paradigm shift on the part of the industry? I think our uh, schools have to show a proof of concept. You know? In concept, K-12 is supposed to produce employable graduates. But industry, have, industry people have yet to see the proof of concept. You know? uh, I, I, I was uh, campaigning for this with PCCI and other uh, friends in industry you know, to start uh, revising their job descriptions so that those jobs that do not require a college degree, you know, can specifically say only high school graduate up to senior year. Uh, it's slow uptake because of uh, their experience with uh, uh, high school graduates. I, I, I'm with a Rotary Club and we donated a girls' dorm in Bukidnon and uh, Sumilao town, town of Sumilao. When we were inaugurating, the mayor was there and uh, he asked us to further support the school with, uh, with digital means of uh, delivering uh, lessons because uh, it seems that the He's not, uh, well, definitely he's not convinced about the competence of uh, those who are handling the learning process there because he did a survey of uh, all the high schools in his towns. And it turned out that more than 40%, close, I think close to 50% of the high school students were found to be illiterate. So these are high school students. Uh, you can, you know, project that uh, to be the case in a number of schools in, in other places. The, the more expensive high schools, you know, who, who train students very well, they produce students who eventually go to college. So these are students who will not seek employment after high school. The ones who will seek employment after high schools are those coming from uh, less endowed school and uh, they're not planning to go to college because of financial and other reasons. Mm -hmm. So their employability is difficult under the present situation. That's why I'm opposed to this universal tuition at the tertiary level, because that money should have been used to improve basic education in the country, yeah. rather than spend on college students from families who can well afford you know, to pay for the tuition 
of their children in college. Okay, thank you very much. I do hope that DepEd, SHED, and the industry can actually sit down together so that we can address these gaps or the mismatch between the skills of the graduates and the need of the industries. Thank you very much. I see the hand of Dr. Vic Paqueo. Vic. I'm Vic Pakeo from PIDS. Um, Sorry. Uh, I have one comment and a question. Um, in the uh, uh, graph that was shown by uh, Dr. Balisakan, uh, which basically came from the World Bank, it shows wage stagnation, more or less, and then with productivity, labor productivity rising, and power to rate coming down. That's intriguing. Uh, why, you know, you see the wage rate stagnating, okay, while productivity is, is rising. And I think um, you need to look at the non-wage benefits, because that wage rate is daily wage rate. When you look at the NEDA data, where basically you use compensation divided by number of workers, you will see that in fact, there is a parallel trend between labor productivity and, um, um, and wage comp uh, uh, total compensation per worker, okay? Which is as predicted by standard economics. Now, my question, however, has to do with this morning's observation about Vietnam being the biggest beneficiary of the old and the new globalization, where it is really reaping, that's where the investment coming from China and the rest of the world uh, are coming from. Uh, trade benefits are, are going there. It's they're benefiting from this even disruptive trade. And, and over the years, they have, of course, uh, despite increasing uh, inequality, the poverty rate has dramatically come down. So my question is this. What did Vietnam do right? What lessons can we learn from Vietnam's experience? Is it because their um, investment environment is friendly to uh, foreign investments? Is it because their labor regulation, laws, and environment provides greater agility and flexibility to companies making decisions, local and foreign? Um, is it because, in fact, their education system are such that actually the learning achievement test in science, mathematics, in Vietnam, their students, they beat OECD countries, the average OECD countries, including England and uh, the United States. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> uh, with respect to, the, to your first observation on the, uh, that pattern uh, concerning the wage rate and labor productivity, we can, we can sit down and discuss the, the details there. But clearly, uh, 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 you can look at other indicators of, uh, of uh, uh, productivity, even uh, land productivity for that matter, uh, you know, other factors. You, you also see uh, that... Uh, uh, similar uh, uh, st uh, story, uh, but I think the, the 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 problem is more complicated than that. I mean, you know, it's it's there are measurement issues. Obviously, there is also comparability of the series in the labor statistics, as uh, we, because we get the changes in uh, in definitions uh, uh, over time. Uh, we can't really look at a very long period. Of of, of time because of those uh, difficulties, uh, problems with the comparability, but 
but the, the point is, uh, uh, even if you look at the, uh, the concept of total income received by households, the fact is, if you look at the last 30 years, the, um, and even the last uh, 15 years where you, you see a quite respectable uh, growth, uh, and if you compare that ability of that growth to reduce poverty uh, in, in our neighbors when they were at similar stages of, of development, you find that that uh, response of, of poverty and other indicators of human development uh, uh, is quite weaker, uh, much weaker in the Philippines than in this country. So that's a, a puzzle for development economy. So what are we doing wrong that uh, our neighbors are doing right? Uh, and that uh, brings me to the next question, the, your, uh, your observations on, on Vietnam. Uh, I think everything that, uh, the, the thing that you noted applies as well. I mean, you know, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, Vietnam is a socialist country, so in the, very er in the early stages of their uh, industrialization, there was much less inequality than what we had here in, uh, in the Philippines. So when you, when you have a country that's growing rapidly and it's starting with a low level of inequality, and especially when that growth is coming from agriculture, you are bound to have a very rapid poverty reduction. Uh, that's not the case that you, the story that you you find uh, in the Philippines because to begin with the level the high level of inequality especially inequality opportunities prevent that uh, uh, level of that rapid growth to 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 uh, trickle down to uh, to the poor so i guess and if you look about talk about um, inequity in access to opportunities then you run into all kinds of problems you know, access to, uh, problem with health, problem with education, problem with infrastructure, problem with finance, and so on. You have to address it's all of these dimensions of, uh, uh, of development. I think we all have them, especially in, in the social sector. I am so worried about uh, the, the social sector. Uh, health and education, the way that we are investing here is, is just does not uh, uh, give us a, a, a good, uh, reasonably promising future, of, especially for the poor today and the children of the poor today. Uh, the data s simply is so, is so shocking that you know one third of our population of their children are are, are malnourished. And so, what kind of competition can they uh, can they bring when this? Uh, as globalization proceeds, as integration of the ASEAN economies proceed, they, they will be simply wiped out. Uh, that's the, the, the problem that we, uh, we are seeing in this country. Thank you, RC. Uh, I'm told time is up, so can we give a big hand to our uh, panel of speakers? and panelists for this uh, very enlightening session on uh, Ways Forward. Let us give them, a, give them again a um, well-disturbed round of applause. Before we um, go to the final part of our um, conference uh, today, um, allow me to show you a video that captures some of the highlights and sidelights of today's event. Watch this. to reach our common goal.
lesson of this story tells us the importance of, be of a belief of beliefs in a society. Our mere beliefs and expectations can turn things around and enable us to get the highest reward. And how do we compete for them, as in how do we keep them? Because governments are now competing. Well, the government's been competing for talent for, for many, many years now, talent and businesses. But now it's much easier for governments also to project their services across the world. So we, as social scientists, have an obligation to think about the future. And the worst way to think about the future is to just pretend it's going to continue being like it is today. The South China Sea today is probably the most important international waterway in the world. To counter the challenges of the new globalization, we formulated our own VUCA, namely vision, unity, consultation, and adaptability. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to all of you our closing speaker, who is a member of the Philippine Senate. He doesn't need a long introduction because he is a well-known public figure, and his name is synonymous to local government, and his father is touted as the father of the local government code, although our uh, closing um, speaker is uh, charting his uh, name in Philippine policy making through his own advocacies, which include the federal system of government. He is currently chair of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and the Senate Committee on Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a round of applause to Senator Aquilino Pimentel III. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, general, just a general greetings to all of you. At the outset, let, uh, let us congratulate the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, PIDS, led by its president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for the successful staging of the fifth annual public policy conference. <laughs> but actually, PIDS is just doing its job as the government's primary socio-economic policy think tank. <laughs> your, theme is, your theme for this conference is an excellent choice because globalization is an important concept for everyone to understand. The increasingly integrated global economy is here to stay. Whatever we think about globalization, the genie is already out of the bottle. In chess parlance, since I'm a chess player, this is touch move. Globalization is here to stay. Since I am sure that your speakers focused on globalization, allow me to focus on the easier word, new. The word news meaning can range from recent, modern, novel, and familiar, having recently come into existence, etc. But whatever meaning we give to the word new, in your phrase, new globalization, my point is this. 
Planners and policy makers must always prepare for newness in this world. This saying is attributed to Heraclitus who allegedly said, there is nothing permanent except change. Even our planners and policy makers will be changed in due time, but while they or while we are still in office, we must always be open to change, be conscious that change will definitely come, and hence have the attitude and the aptitude of always anticipating the future and preparing for change. Prepare for the newness, not only in globalization, but in everything. Your Senate has finally organized a new standing committee named Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovation, and Futures Thinking. Bago po yan. Chaired by Senator Pia Cayetano. So we have to wish her luck. We did this so that the Senate can anticipate, keep up, and properly react to our fast-changing world, which is caused by the rapidly changing preferences and behaviors of people. We know that something is happening because we can feel something happening. Our world order is changing. So-called economic nationalism is on the rise. Immigration is getting stricter and tougher. Institutions like the WTO, IMF, World Bank, and other international organizations have less influence now. Many nations are looking inward. Sabi nila, our people first. If this is the meaning of the new globalization mentioned, mentioned in your theme, then it is good that PIDS is helping our country prepare for this new world arrangement. But however way we prepare for this new globalization, I submit, I'm a lawyer, that's why I use this language, I submit that we have to improve the culture of the Philippines if we want as a nation to succeed under any world order. Maski ano pa, we have to change our culture. We have to live under a culture of fairness in the Philippines. We have to develop a culture of science in the Philippines. We have to have a culture of honesty in the Philippines. Even if we are able to cope with this new globalization, if our society is not fair, if the gap between the rich and the poor is unconscionable, if the justice system is loaded against the poor and always in favor of the rich, then this is a society I would not want my children and grandchildren to be in. And who knows, the social volcano that we step on every day might even blow up on our faces. So, PIDS, let us work for a fair society. What drives most of the changes we see today? It is no other than science and technology. How can we succeed in a highly scientific and technological world if we do not have a culture of science here in the Philippines? Without a scientific culture, we will continue to be the consumers that we have always been, even under this new globalization. Hence, we need to start inventing and producing original things which the rest of the world wants. The Philippines should be a nation of scientists, inventors, programmers, and original manufacturers. So, PIDS, let us work for a scientific society. Still a serious problem up to this date is corruption. So the recent uh, uncovering of massive fraud in field health, which is now the subject of a Senate investigation in aid of legislation, is especially troubling as it occurs in an institution which delivers such a basic service to the poorest of the poor and involves people who have taken the oath to abstain from harming or doing wrong to any man. Yun po yung oath ng mga doktor. Then there is also the recent revelations of corruption in the Bureau of Corrections. There are many other incidents or examples. This will only destroy our day, so I will no longer mention them. 
But still, I have to say this. There are corrupt, there are corrupt lawyers, doctors, military and police personnel, engineers, and even low-ranking employees in the government. There is even corruption in the private sector. So it is obvious that corruption has not been addressed by our formal educational system. But is there really a way to teach people how not to be corrupt? To this question, I do not know the answer. So hence, PIDs, please pay attention also to the problem of corruption, which is not only a criminal issue, but also, I submit, a socio-economic one. So modern society has many challenges. This is, this is actually what makes life exciting, especially for us who want to solve actual and real problems, so-called problem solvers. So on my part as the chairman of the Senate Committees on Foreign Relations and Trade, Commerce, and Entrepreneurship, I am open to talk about local solutions to modern-day problems, including these so-called global problems. I have filed some bills, uh, allow me to mention them, to help among the bills I have filed. To help address the problems of our OFWs, I have proposed the creation of the Department of OFWs. To help address the problems of micro-entrepreneurs, I have proposed the Pondo Para Sa Pagbabago at pag or P3 program. This bill proposes to institutionalize the P3 program of the Small Business Corporation to provide micro-enterprises a cheaper source of financing, thereby addressing the financing concerns of our micro-entrepreneurs, especially those among the poorest of the poor. This is the so-called 5-6 killer. To put an end to this so-called global waste trade affecting our country, I have, I have proposed a waste importation ban law. We will ban the importation of waste under any guise. If we, if we want to convert waste to energy, then let us convert domestic waste to energy. We should not import waste for the alleged purpose of uh, converting it to energy. We will prevent the Philippines from becoming the dumping ground of the world. To prepare our children early for this new globalization, I have also proposed the teaching of code at the basic education level. This is Senate Bill Number 99, the integration of computer science in the curricul curriculum of the K-12 program bill. To help develop our science culture, I have proposed the creation of the Research and Development Council of the Philippines. The state should be willing to directly fund research and development programs. These are just some of the bills I have filed. I hope that the scope of these bills covers most of the areas affected by this new globalization. But even if they do not, what is important is my willingness as a legislator to sit down with stakeholders and with those affected by change and even with those to be affected by anticipated change so that we can prepare early to meet these challenges and to meet these changes and upcoming challenges. So at the end of the day, we all only have one primary goal, the fair and sustainable development and progress of our country and our people. So thank you, Pitts, for this invitation. Senator Coco Pimentel is very much willing to use his cocote together with you for the good of our country. So once again, congratulations to PIDs and to all of the participants. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Senator Coco, for your presence today and for uh, the words of wisdom that you have shared with all of us. You, the challenges that you have uh, put upon PIDS will inspire us to work harder in the service of our uh, policymakers, so we can craft, help craft them uh, evidence-based policies, programs, and projects. So this, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our uh, fifth annual public policy conference on the theme, Navigating the New Globalization, Local Actions for Global Challenges. But before we finally close, Allow me to thank once again our sponsors on behalf of Dr. Celeres and the whole PIDS, 
the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, National Economic and Development Authority, the Department of the Interior and Local Government, the Department of Foreign Affairs, in particular the Office of the Undersecretary for International e Economic Relations, the Philippine Competition Commission, the Department of Trade and Industry, and last but not the least, the Asian Development Bank. We also would like to thank, of course, the members of the DPRM uh, Steering Committee, and also uh, the support in partnership of uh, the Radio TV Malacanang for uh, covering this event, which allowed us to reach more people. The, um, the presentations will be made available on our website and also the uh, APPC. We hope that through, your, through this conference, we have inspired you to act locally, but think globally. Marami pong salamat at magandang gabi sa inyong lahat.